So once again, we come full circle and we're going to again discuss Frank Lloyd Wright. So we had talked at the beginning about his textile block houses in LA in the early 1920s. And this is a, another little moment of, of, of peak progress by Wright and work. Uh, but by the mid 20s, his life is in disarray again. He had married a woman and it didn't go well. <laughs> she, she was a bit of a nutcase to be quite honest. And uh, that, that turned messy. He had a lot of personal problems going on. And by the late 20s, he had once again faded into obscurity and had very little work and was, was struggling to get by. And again, people wrote him off. They said, well, okay, he had this one last little gasp of inspiration with his textile block houses in the 1920s and then that was it and you know he was now in his what 50s or 60s and by the 1930s we're in the midst of the great depression and people thought they'd heard the last of frank lloyd wright well don't ever count out frank lloyd wright uh that was almost uh, uh you know a a, a uh challenge for him you know once people start writing him off and we're going to talk about arguably his most famous work falling water and bear run from 1936 and this also brings us full circle although this uh, we're out of sequence but the client is edgar kaufman and his son and wife lillian and we just talked about the kaufman house in pass in um in Palm Springs by Neutra, same client, same family. That was their California getaway, uh, and they hired Neutra in the 1940s to design it. But their first big commission was for Frank Lloyd Wright to design a weekend getaway house in the mountains outside of Pittsburgh, which is where they live. And Wright gets this commission almost by chance. He had started his Taliesin design school and Edgar Kaufman Jr. was attending the school and was really inspired by the, the ideas that Wright had. And his, his, he came from a very wealthy family of department stores in Pittsburgh. And, you know, when the family talked about maybe building this little country house, uh, getaway house, he said, hey, dad, mom, let's, let's hire this guy that I've been working with, Frank Lloyd Wright. You know, why not? So they do, and uh, the, the rest is history. So uh, arguably speaking, the Kaufman family is probably one of the most important um, clients of American architecture of the 20th century. So here is Wright. Uh, uh, yeah, he's in, his, he's in his 60s and the 30s, and like I say, most people had written him off. You know, it's time for him to retire. You know, what more new ideas can you come up? Architecture seems to have moved past him. The international exhibition by MoMA featured some early works of Wright as kind of like, hey, these were the inspirations for the great architecture that's being done now. And that was the challenge that lit the fire under Wright uh, was like, hey, don't write me off. I can do really innovative stuff better than the modernists that are working today. And the project was for a weekend house in the mountains outside of Pittsburgh. The Kaufmans owned this property and there was a stream that flowed through and on the left you can see a historic photo of the Kaufman family. They would love to bathe in the water in the summertime and and this beautiful waterfall that uh, was the sort of highlight of their property. And there were some rocks on top of the waterfall that they, they had a sunny spot and they would lay out and get some sun. And and when they hired Wright, they thought, oh, great, we'll have them build a house uh, where we can look out the window at this beautiful waterfall that we've always loved and admired. And the famous story, of course, is they got something completely different. Uh, so here we see the historic view on the left and we see the waterfall on the right. But when they show up with the plans, Wright had flipped the script on them and said, no, I'm going to build the house on top of the waterfall and let the water and the, the stream literally flow through the house. And if Wright had always been uh, really motivated and inspired to unite nature and architecture, this is where you, arguably he does it most successfully. And so the 
the this the rocks that they that they sun on become the living room and the bedroom essentially of now where they will be sleeping and living and the waterfall that they so admired they can literally walk down this little flight of stairs and they're right into the stream and they can splash around in the water and so forth and then ironically probably a bit of his ego is that when they want to get this beautiful vista of the waterfall as we see here now they're looking at his beautiful architecture uh, some some would say that he did that on purpose to sort of put his architecture front and center uh, and what's really amazing about this house is this has a lot of concrete in it, just the way we saw with uh, Unity Temple. Also has some serious structural issues. Uh, the, the balconies had to be essentially rebuilt about 20 years ago. But it's anchored by this stonework here, this sort of core, vertical core here, that is all stone from the, you know, the surrounding site. Uh, so it's part of, it's an organic part of the site itself. And then the concrete balconies that like come out off of that are, are essentially very organic. You have this solid trunk, and then you have these branches that stretch out from that but all done not in a floral manner that Louis Sullivan uh, had been working with in the turn of the 20th century and late 19th century, but in a very modern uh, contemporary way. This is in the living room with the big fireplace. These, the boulders of the natural site are incorporated into the concrete floor of the building itself. And these are some of the rocks that they would lay out and sun on, literally. Uh, and so now they can sit here and stay warm by the fire on a cool mountain night. And a great view of the uh, balcony and the staircase that descends from that to the water, just above the water level here. And it is a, it's a free floating stair. We see the open risers and it's all hung from the balcony above. There's no anchoring underneath it. It's really a marvel of, of structural engineering. And you walk down this staircase to a platform and then that's it. There's, there's no wall around it. There's no structure underneath it. It's just hovering above the flowing water. Uh, it's really an incredible experience to go uh, you know, walk down that. In floor plan, it's pretty simple. Uh, the bridge that we were just standing on in that vista is right here, looking down over the stream. And here is the staircase that descends down to the water level. The main living room is just a big open space. You know, this is also a weekend house, but we've already seen the the influence of the big open living area with no walls at all, taking Wright's early ideas uh, to the extreme. Uh, and then lots of exterior balconies that stretch out. So you can sit out on these balconies and you're literally hovering over top of, you know, very dramatically over the waterfall. This is a view up the driveway. This is more of the backside of the house, but you get a sense, better sense of the, you know, vertical core of the natural stonework and how it blends organically with uh, the boulders on site. He doesn't take a bulldozer to the site and rip it all away. The house grows out of the landscape. And this is one of the most critical aspects of Wright's architecture. He always wants his buildings to be part of the site. And this is no better accomplished than here at Falling Water. Here's another view of that grand living space. So no walls at all separating any of the various rooms or uses throughout the space. It's just one big open room. This makes Frank Lloyd Wright famous. Uh, he, you know, he, he was well known in architectural circles for sure, but this house got him on the cover of Time Magazine and in all kinds of you know more broad mainstream media that the average person you know who didn't know what a prairie school house was and that was long gone they were just old houses to the people in the 1930s by this point this makes Frank Lloyd Wright a cultural phenomenon and uh, really revives his career almost from complete obscurity and now all of a sudden people are like 
I want, I want that house, right? They think if they hire Frank Lloyd Wright, they'll get another falling water. And so people start flooding to him, both commercial clients and residential clients to design their buildings and their houses so that they might too get a falling water because this truly was famous almost from the day it was built. And examples, of, first of all, was himself being his own client and that's his, his own design school of Taliesin. It had been located at Taliesin in Spring Green, Wisconsin, but he more and more, especially as he got older, he really wanted a summer retreat uh, or excuse me, a winter retreat, just like people still do today. And as you get older and you get arthritis and the cold affects you, uh, he really wanted a place to get away from uh, the cold winters. And so he starts a tent camp out in Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, and that eventually evolves into a more permanent uh, home and studio uh, now known as Taliesin West from 1937. And this is a floor plan. Uh, we see remnants of that sprawling, not quite pinwheel design, but we're fully now into his, what I call his geometric phase. Lots of triangles and circles and angles and not rectangular boxes anymore. Uh, he really breaks away from the uh, recti uh, rectilinear geometry of the Prairie School and, and 1920s work into these funky, um, sometimes over over geometric uh, triangles and so forth. So here's a historic view of of the building early on, and you can see the desert landscape of Scottsdale, uh, the mountains in the background. That's still natural. All the vista you see on the right is all filled with styrofoam houses now. It's, you know, Scottsdale is part of the greater uh, Phoenix metropolitan area. And, and the beautiful land, desert vista that he had originally is just filled with houses now. And a few views of, of the building as it exists. And like Falling Water, this house is rooted to the landscape of, of its setting. He takes boulders and rocks from the site and he uses them in uh, the concrete forms that he creates. And he takes this sort of red painted uh, wood and, and uh, just sort of uh, uh, adds this all over. So here you see the the, the the granite boulders that are all around the site. He puts this into the concrete forms and pours the concrete in and you get this sort of weird admixture of these giant boulders interplayed with the, with the concrete itself. And then the dra uh, dramatic angle here is representative of the steep slopes of the mountain vistas all around as well. Here's another view of that concrete, and you can see it, it you know, visually it just completely blends in with the, with the mountainscapes off in the distance. This is a view of the studio on the left. Uh, the, it was originally built as a temporary structure with tent canvas over the roof, and over time he made it more and more permanent, and now it's more of a permanent roof structure with these very dramatic roof beams. These, these wood, elements, these are beams so that the interior uh, can be completely column free and you have this big open design studio space. And we see some of the, these are clear story windows in the studio space that let in lots of light. There's a historic view of Wright sitting at the drafting table with some of his apprentices. These are the students that would pay him <laughs> to work. To, to generally, they would do the design work, you know, and drafting and so forth uh, for his projects. And that was their, quote, education, which was traditional in a way to, uh, to the apprentice method of early architects, except the client or the, the architect would pay the, the client or their, their workers to, to do work for them and they would learn and then they maybe go off on their own. Wright turns that around and he has his own workers pay him <laughs> for the pleasure of doing work for him. Uh, and he calls it, quote, an education. Uh, it was sort of an odd uh, way, but it was brilliant move by Wright because he was always pressed for money. And so he actually gets people working for him to pay him to, to work for him. And a view of the... Uh, the studio space, or, or not, not the studio space, one of the, the living areas here. Okay.